All right, I was going to stand up and wander around a little bit because uh, I'm tired. I don't want to fall asleep during my own presentation because um, that would be bad. Where are you? Here we go. All right, so welcome to an introduction to software defined radio. Uh, I'm Dan. Hi. So, um, I had to uh, change the focus of the talk just a little bit because of uh, um, some uh, some problems I was having with some uh, some software and such. Uh, I actually was uh, awake at five in the morning recompiling some things uh, this morning because I was having some issues and um, was still having those issues at uh, at ten when I woke up. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to do a live demonstration, but I do have the hardware here to, to uh, show, and uh, we're going to go uh, kind of behind the scenes and uh, some of the uh, some of the theory that uh, that goes behind it. So um, rather than giving you a practical demonstration of oh look, you can make a little FM receiver and you can make a TV receiver and basically just uh, do the the uh, the pre-rolled demonstrations uh, give you a little bit of, uh, of background information so maybe you can actually go through and uh, understand what's going on uh, if you want to get into this sort of thing. So what is software defined radio? Who, who in this room already has some concept of, of the idea of software defined radio? All right, just a few people, a uh, quarter or so. Uh, well, uh, for the rest of you, it's, it's uh, basically a flexible uh, hardware, piece of hardware that can bring radio signals in uh, whole scale or wholesale rather um, as compared to like say an FM receiver, a uh, little transistor radio that's bringing in a small portion of radio. Uh, you're, you're tuning to say 91.1 uh, on, on the FM dial. Woo. Uh, you're bringing in some uh, 200 kilohertz wide chunk of the radio spectrum, and you're turning that into audio, and you're listening to it. Well, what software-defined radio lets us do is um, we can bring a large chunk of that rate of that same radio spectrum, say the entire FM broadcast band, and we can bring it down into a computer for further processing, so that we can, uh, rather than having a specialized piece of hardware and having another specialized piece of hardware and another specialized piece of hardware, the same hardware can tune into any FM radio or any TV broadcast or any HDTV broadcast or really within limits anything that uh, is in the, the radio spectrum. Um, and uh, like I say, uh, the second point here is, is minimal hardware requirements and that just refers to you have to have an expensive box in the front end but on the back end you don't need this piece and this piece of hardware and this piece of hardware. If you're uh, like a ham radio enthusiast and you, um, you you may know how expensive it is to get the uh, the all-in-one version. It's five ten thousand dollars for a piece of hobbyist gear, um, which is a little out of my budget. Uh, I don't know about you guys. Uh, yeah. Uh, what software? Uh, GNU Radio. Uh, that is, it's really for 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 hobbyists and, uh, and and people who are doing research and things who don't have a lot of money to spend. That is the option. Uh, that's the only option. Um, the other guys out there doing doing big iron research, that sort of stuff is, is very expensive. GNU Radio, absolutely free, um, free as in speech and beer. Um, you go download it, get the source, mess around with it. It's been going for about, um, it's been, been about 10 years now. It's been in active development and um, if, if you, uh, actually you can subscribe to the developer list and you can see it's, it's continually going. There are a couple of guys who make it their jobs to, um, to maintain this thing and improve it and keep it going. And then, well now we have to have a hardware component to bring those, uh, the, the radio signals into our system. So that, uh, well but with GNU Radio, it is generalized. You can do anything you want to. You could build your own hardware if you wanted to, write an interface. That's just fine. But uh, if you want the easy solution, which I kind of like easy, uh, the Universal Software Radio Peripheral was designed for GNU Radio, and it was designed with GNU Radio. And so they've, they've kind of come up together, and um, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, you hear the guy who, uh, who worked on some of this stuff, um, uh, uh, Matt Edis, uh, and uh, 
can't think of the other guy's name. Uh, some of these guys that started this uh, this way back, they were using a two thousand dollar data acquisition card. Uh, they would it's a PCI card, a two channel. You plug it in, and it brings in um, some some crazy like a hundred million samples per second, and the computer tries to process that as best it can. It's it's a lot of data. Um, like I said, two thousand dollars or seven hundred for USRP. I'd pick the cheaper option. Um, so what the USRP is, it's um, got four high-speed uh, analog to digital converters in it, um, four high-speed digital to analog converters, and some uh, different uh, DACs and ADCs that uh, are for peripheral uses. We'll get into that later. Um, yes. Now. I just realized I'm going through these slides way too fast. I need to stop and talk a bit. Uh, all right. So on the uh, on the USRP receive side, uh, we're, we're dealing with these analog to digital converters. Has um, anybody uh, messed around with, uh, with with any signal theory, uh, any uh, anything like that? Uh, messing around with audio? Uh, it's it's. A lot of the same uh, same concepts that uh, apply to audio and uh, digital audio apply to this high speed processing. It's just at a much higher rate, a much uh, uh, larger amount of data, a much larger, a much greater amount of data that's coming in that you have to deal with. Uh, and the uh, the analog to digital converters that are in the USRP are 12 bit, meaning for every sample uh, that's 64 million times a second, you're getting 12 bits of information. About your signal, um, and those those ADCs each are paired into uh, what what we're called uh, what we're going to call IQ channels, and we'll get into that again a little bit later. Uh, on the transmit side, it's um, kind of the mirror image of the ADCs. The digital analog converters they're a little bit faster, um, 128 million uh, million points per second. Uh, they're a little bit more accurate for, at 14 bits per sample. Um, and then these, just like the ADCs, you can, um, you can, you. It is possible to actually split them up into four separate sets and uh, listen to four separate data sources or, or whatnot. But you can also pair them together in what they call IQ channels. And again, we'll get into that. Um, and for uh, data and control, um, it's got some low-speed ADCs and DACs. And what we'll use those for is uh, reading. Different uh, different attributes. Like if we, um, there there's some um, other hardware uh, features in here that that you need to make the USRP work. That we'll talk about. But um, you can use these lower speed speed signals to uh, to configure those to 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 uh, set them up in ways that you can't really do digitally. Um, hmm, I wonder where I put that slide. Oh. The uh, the daughter boards in the USRP, uh, the USRP is a big is a big data acquisition board. It uh, really what it consists of is uh, uh, four slots uh, that you can plug these daughter boards into, and these these daughter boards go from basically radio world to uh, the on the uh, circuit board. So what they they translate between your antenna. And these uh, analog digital converters. The base system, this is the $700 um, doodad, is really only suitable for listening to one of these daughter boards. Uh, it does the uh, the job of translating between uh, the uh, the over the air signals, the off the air signals, and uh, what these uh, ADCs can actually listen to. Um, now there are places for two transmitters on every board. And there are places for uh, two receivers on every board. And what they can allow us to do, again, uh, with the theory that we're going to talk about in a bit, they can actually take uh, something that's that's technically unreachable for the uh, USRP data acquisition hardware to to see, and we can bring it down into into what it can see. Um, and now, here's that slide. Uh, we get into information theory because everybody should know more about information theory. Uh, hmm. There we go.
Everybody doing good so far? Haven't lost anybody, I hope. All right. Now, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the theory behind behind this guy, because uh, really it kind of comes down to it. If you don't know what's going on back here, you're not going to be able to do a whole lot with the system. Um, it's not really uh, it's not really a toy. I wish it was, <laughs> but. Um, you really kind of need to go, need to understand what's going on behind the scenes in order to effectively use this guy. Uh, information theory, brought to you by the letters I and Q. Um, let's start out with uh, with Mr. Claude Shannon. Anybody ever heard that name before? Um, few people. Uh, I think I misspelled his name. Uh, <laughs> he was the father of uh, information theory. He he started out um, a lot of his work during during World War II, uh, back when a lot of the, the topics that are really big in electrical engineering, uh, or really a lot of really developed topics in electrical engineering were just being, just being thought of and, and developed. Um, well, he worked in uh, cryptography and um, fire control systems. Uh, I, I think that uh, is uh, shooting, not uh, actual putting out fires. but. Uh, he, uh, along with some other pioneers of, of electrical engineering, um, worked on uh, worked on this control theory and, and developed that a little bit. Um, but uh, he had some some ideas rolling around in his head, working with uh, with this cryptography and the control theory. And, and and he said, you know, some of this stuff, some of this stuff is kind of it, it makes sense. It works together. So there, we need to come up with something. That, that fits all of this stuff together and, and kind of gives us a general idea of information. So what he did after the war, and, and I think 1948, he wrote a paper uh, and he basically laid down the foundation of information theory and he invented the bit, basically. Um, any finite information can be represented in bits. Um, now that's uh, that's basically any any a signal, my voice, um, a phone conversation, um, a satellite communication, basically anything that's not, say, like infinite, um, infinite radio waves, like you know the entire electromagnetic spectrum unbounded. That that can't be represented in bits. That's a bit of a limitation, or not, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and he also did some other things, like applied Boolean algebra to electrical circuits for the first time. Relatively unimportant. Um, now, who, who's ever heard of this? Uh, the Shannon limit. It's uh, it's really important uh, when you're dealing with uh, with uh, information theory and data acquisition in general. What it means is, uh, what he says is, you can only perceive a signal that's half the frequency of your sample rate. Um, so if you if you go the other direction, if you have a certain frequency that you want to represent, say. Uh, four kilohertz, which is about the highest frequency that you can get away with representing my voice. Um, you would need to sample at eight kilohertz because in order to actually record that four kilohertz signal, you would need to sample 8,000 times a second. So uh, Shannon laid this down and uh, what it means is, like, like I was saying, if, if you want to represent a signal, of, of a certain bandwidth, which um, for audio is about 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz. And I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm still not uh, uh, up around 20 kilohertz, but uh, uh, as you grow older, your, your hearing starts to uh, degrade a bit. But uh, children can hear up to 20 or so kilohertz. So what, uh, what recording engineers said is we want to be able to represent all of, uh, all of the audible hearing range uh, in our in our CDs and, and, and whatnot, in our recording technology. So, well, let's say, let's sample at 40 kilohertz. And what we ended up actually with is the CD sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which is um, about the minimum you can do to represent your entire audio spectrum. Um, now, um, why, why is it that uh, that the Shamanton limit exists. What does that? Um, what is it? Uh, why is it that the Shannon limit exists? So if you if you imagine a sine wave, and I wish I had something to uh, to draw on, but uh, 
unfortunately I don't. Imagine you have a, a big a sweeping sine wave. So if you um, sample at the same frequency as this sine wave, you're basically going to sample here and here and here. So if you take those points, if you, if you wipe the sine wave away, you take those points and then you plot them on a graph, you're going to end up with nothing. You're just going to see a straight line. Um, so that's kind of a problem, uh, as you might imagine. You recorded a signal and you got nothing. Um, now, uh, in, in addition, if you, if you have a, a, a signal that's slightly higher or lower than your sampling frequency, you'll start to see other frequencies emerge. And you can actually graph this out. You can hit a sample here and here and here, and you'll see um, some smaller, some slower waveform will emerge. Um, that's pretty easy to do, do on a piece of paper if you ever get bored, um, or right now if you like. Um, now, what, what that allows us to do, um, what, uh, what that gives us is, uh, is these things called alias frequencies that are these false frequencies that don't really exist. Um, and you might be familiar with the term aliasing. It's uh, uh, back in the day when we had crappy computer graphics. Um, you take a high quality graphic signal, you would uh, downsample it, basically pick the points that you, that you could display off of your image, and you would end up with this disgusting jaggy image uh, that you would then have to anti-alias. Um, and that's a, that's a little more of a complicated, uh, I guess, co conception of aliasing. It's a kind of a spatial frequency thing. But um, it's the same concept, is uh, trying to downsample a signal, trying to sample a signal that is, uh, is, has much more information than you can actually represent. Now this uh, this FS uh, this is our, our frequency sampling frequency it's uh, a pretty common terminology and uh, when you see the Shannon limit expressed it's it's usually it's usually just shorthand FS over two um, so now frequencies above F FS over two uh, if you haven't done something to get rid of them they will interfere with your normal in band that you're trying to get signals so what we can do is take a filter. Uh, and actually um, that uh, acquires, it takes the, uh, the entire band and it chops off above a certain frequency. So what you're going to do is uh, basically set the, uh, the filter point to about half your sampling frequency and we'll get rid of, hopefully get rid of the, the stuff you don't want to see that's just going to interfere with your, with your, uh, with your sampling. Um, now Another, uh, another implication of this, though, is we could potentially make use of aliasing. Uh, and and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it sounds like a pretty disgusting problem, and it is. Um, but it can, in certain circumstances, be useful. So what, uh, what we can do, our, our problem is, we, uh, we need to sample a signal. Um, and if we go back to our USRP, uh, we, we talked about the analog to digital converters being 64 mega sample per second acquisition. So that means the highest frequency that they can understand effectively is 32 megahertz. So 0 to 32 megahertz, they're fine. Above that and you start to see, uh, you start to get what's called fold back and, and frequencies that are higher start to appear lower and they start to, say you have a frequency that is um, 1 megahertz and 10 megahertz and then 50 megahertz. Well, you're not going to see 50 megahertz. You're going to see something here. So that's, it, it's not real. You're, you're aliasing. So how can, we, uh, how can we make use of that? We filter out the frequencies that normally we would want to be seeing, those from 0 to 32 megahertz. Um, and then we take the frequencies above 64 megahertz and we filter those out. So now we have a chunk of, of, uh, of, of bandwidth, 32 megahertz wide from 32 to 64 megahertz. And that's going to get folded back. And you're going to see it as a reverse image in your sample, in your, in your, uh, in your sampling stream. Uh, now you're going to get a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of signal degradation, but you know, it, it does the job. Um, if you're if you're kind of in a bind, 
uh, you can use this. Uh, this is called undersampling. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll be able to see signals that theoretically you kind of shouldn't be able to. Um, and you can make use of this in the USRP if, uh, if you need to. It's not a, a, a terribly common, uh, a ter terribly common application, but it just kind of goes to illustrate uh, kind of what's going on with this, uh, this Shannon limit. limit. So now we get to uh, some more practical, uh, practical topics in how the USRP is doing its job. So what can we do to maybe select out a frequency um, in, in a little bit less of a hackish way? Um, so we can use uh, an idea called heterodyning, uh, which is basically it's, it's trigonometry. And we'll, we'll go through that here in just a minute. So using this trigonometric identity. And uh, I don't really understand how this works. I looked it up in a book. Um, I, I don't understand trigonometric ident identities. They've always eluded me. Um, but um, it's, it's an identity. You can look it up. Uh, cosine A times cosine B is equal to half cosine A plus B plus half cosine A plus B. So what we can do is, uh, maybe this would be easier, be easier if I had some kind of pointer. So what we do all right. So what we'll do is make, uh, make some substitutions here. Uh, we'll take a and let that be equal to 2 pi times the first frequency that, uh, that we're acquiring uh, times t, which uh, that this 2 pi t thing, you can sort of ignore that for now, but just uh, uh, kind of have the idea that uh, uh, this, uh, this first term, cosine a, is um, a signal we have coming in. Cosine b is a signal that we're generating. Uh, so this a term, we're, we're setting this to be our, our frequency coming in, and that's kind of given to us. We don't have control over that. Uh, this B term, we're now generating a frequency, uh, F2, that is approximately equal to F1. And now the effect of that is when you multiply these two guys together, you get two terms, which one is a new, uh, a new frequency at F1 plus F2, and another new frequency at F1 minus F2. And everything else just kind of goes away. Um, so now we can use this in a very, very particular way. Let's see. Oh, yes. So there's our, there's our formula, and that's, uh, that's our uh, F1 plus F2 and F1 minus F2. So one sinusoid at, it's, it's way out there, uh, at, at double our frequency. Say we're tuning into 91.1 megahertz. Um, so our one sinusoid is going to be at... Uh, 180 something megahertz. Uh, the other one is going to be kind of close to zero. So we've got these two massively separated out uh, signals that we can now we can now process and uh, and deal with. So, like I said, one very high frequency, one very low frequency, um, and now we can use a low pass filter, and we can be really lazy about this now because. Uh, the low-pass filter doesn't even have to be very good because these signals are so far apart uh, frequency-wise. Uh, so now we've got our frequency is inside of 32 megahertz easily. Okay, so F1 is what's coming in. F2 yes. Is the frequency you create using the software in the back. Yes. And then you just mix in and take. And that's how you get it. Yes. It's, it's, it's really, um, it, it sounds a little bit complicated, but it really, it, it is just dead simple. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so we're well within, uh, if, if we're tuning in uh, um, an, a single FM channel, uh, like 91.1, uh, we're using now like 200 kilohertz of our, of our 32 megahertz, and it's well within our, um, our capable capability of reception. Uh, and now this is, uh, this is kind of where this IQ thing comes from. 
Um, so again, I, I kind of wanted to be able to draw this out, but I wasn't able to. Uh, we have uh, these four acquisition uh, chips, or these are these four uh, analog digital converters uh, in our system, and two of them can be set as complementary uh, IQ channels. And what that lets us do is if we have a waveform uh, that's you know, sitting there going up and down, we can uh, sample, um, at our, our sample rate is 64 uh, mega samples per second. So the I channel is going to sample here and here, and here, and here. That's going to be, uh, again, 64 million times a second. The Q channel is, uh, in hardware, it's, it's designed like this to be aligned so that a quarter of the way into the next sample period, it samples. So you go doo-doo, doo-doo, doo-doo. And so that um, just gets us, it's a, a kind of a a complicated way of getting us some better noise figures, uh, and, and th this is how the uh, the USRP does it. So, it's not important to know how; it's just important to know that it is. All right. Hmm. All right. Now we kind of get into the meat of it. Now that we know something, uh, now this is uh, this is the uh, the actual USRP um, right here. Hmm. Short cord. So we have our. So is this something you build or buy? You uh, you buy it. Uh, you uh, buy it, and actually, this is this is the the guy right here. Uh, you be, buy it basically as a as a, a kit with uh, circuit boards. Yeah. Okay. And then 64 uh, samples per second. That's the limitation of the hardware. Uh, yeah. There's uh, there are a couple of uh, analog devices, data acquisition chips on here, and they're they're set at 64 um, mega samples per second. So something a little higher would be uh, a lot more expensive. Um, but this uh, this design is uh, about five or six years old. So probably probably I mean. More expensive, definitely, but maybe not that much. I haven't gone in and priced them, but uh, some of these these acquisition chips can cost twenty, forty, fifty, hundred dollars, depending on what you're doing and, and how fast it needs to be, and, and things like that. Um, these obviously are not a hundred dollar a piece uh, acquisition chips, but uh, they, I mean they aren't cheap. Um, all right, so. Let's uh, let's just go in here from a, a receiver standpoint. So you've got over here on the far right, you've got an RXA daughter board, and that is that's the guy that's actually receiving our radio signals and buffering it in to send to our analog digital converters. Uh, it's sending these uh, this IQ data stream, or depending on how the uh, the actual daughter board uh, the hardware is. Uh, is developed. It could have two different radio receivers on it, and those are in completely independent channels. It basically sends us <coughs> two analog to digital um, or <laughs> digital streams representing what the uh, the RX daughter board is seeing. Um, I'm sorry, that those are analog over there uh, on the right side of this uh, 80 the 8882. I think it's kind of hard to read. Uh, and it goes through this 12-bit ADC conversion again, 64 mega sample per second. Uh, it's converted into uh, a binary format. It goes into the FPGA here, and uh, the FPGA, all, all that guy is, is it's a, a non-specialized processor. It's basically um, hardware that you can write. You can sort of write code and rewire it. It's, so it's it's like um, your own custom uh, custom integrated circuit, but uh, you actually can just update it at a whim if you feel like it. Uh, so you can pretty much put anything you want to in there. Um, and this guy processes the data in a certain way, and then sends it out over the USB, uh, and then sends that to your computer and GNU radio. So we've been talking about all this uh, all the data. Uh, 64 mega samples per second uh, times four. Well, USB 2 is only 480 mega, uh, megabits per second, and 
that's that's 60 megabytes per second. It's really, really not that fast. Um, so, you know, what do we do with all this data? Or, you know, are we just throwing it away? What 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 is this buying us? Um, so, well, we have these uh, we have this FPGA here to handle this for us. Um, it can basically do any sort of down conversion that we want. We can tune it to do uh, to down con down convert certain frequencies. We can uh, basically do whatever we want with it uh, within reason to uh, see a specific section of uh, of the spectrum that we want to. And then here's a diagram of what's going on inside that FPGA. So you see, <clears throat> coming in from the left here, are your two uh, digital streams. Um, it multiplies these, and this is uh, and this is that trigonometric identity that we we're talking about. Um, you can look at these uh, actually separately. Uh, this guy is getting multiplied uh, by this. This guy we don't have control over. It's some frequency. This guy is. Uh, the frequency that we're trying to cause our output stream to be centered around. So uh, again, like um, we're, we're seeing, we're getting the entire uh, FM broadcast spectrum in here in digital form, and we want to look at 91.1. So we generate 91.1 megahertz in this uh, in this oscillator here. Uh, it uh, multiplies those two together. Then what comes out is centered around zero, and then everything else is crap. Uh, so what it does is goes in here and downsamples that. It filters it and downsamples it so that uh, not only are we only looking at this small amount of bandwidth that we actually wanted to look at, we're only sending that data across the USB. So now we can look at exactly what we want to see rather than just everything. Uh, and that helps us uh, keep from clogging up our computer processor with a bunch of garbage that we don't care about. Um, so what, what this boils down to is the USRP hardware is uh, it's just a big downsampling box. It takes um, it, a very small part of it is radio reception. It's, uh, a very small part of it is uh, that analog to digital conversion. The most, most of the, the actual hardware on here is dedicated to down converting signals, and that uh, includes these uh, these daughter board cards and what's going on in the FPGA numerically. Um, so it it seems kind of like a cheat, kind of a cop out, because the promise of GNU Radio is that you can have uh, an analog digital converter that basically looks at the entire the, the entire radio spectrum and just kind of at its whim tunes in whatever it likes. Well, that's really not the case because um, our analog to digital converters are not that good yet and our computers are not that good yet, honestly. We, we, we can't, we don't have uh, 50 giga sample per second ADCs and we don't have computers that can, that can deal with that kind of information yet. So um, for now, this is kind of what we have and, and what we're working with. So we'll look at these daughter cards here and you can see them uh, there are the uh, the guys here. This dude and this dude. They have the uh, the wires plugged into them. Uh, they are what actually interfaces this uh, USRP hardware to the outside world, the radio world. Um, and this one, this, this smaller one on here, that's got much less metal on it, is uh, is called the uh, the basic RX board. And all that is, it's a um, it's a silicon. Um, I should say it's an active buffer. It takes in radio signals, amplifies them so that uh, the USRP hardware can actually acquire them. Um, it doesn't do anything special. Uh, it basically just serves as a buffer to the outside world, plain and simple. So, well, that sounds kind of boring, but uh, yikes. Uh, that sounds kind of boring, but wh what can you do with it? it? It turns out there's a lot of stuff going on under 32 megahertz. Um, you can hear AM broadcast radio, all of it. You can hear nav beacons. Well, you know, if you like to hear people beep out their call signs all day, that's fun. Uh, shortwave radio, all around the world. Ham radio, CB radio, all under 32 megahertz. So all of that stuff is accessible with that whole front end to this to this guy. Now, if we get a little fancier we can move up uh, in complexity and we have this guy is called the TVRX card 
And you can look at that. You might, you might uh, think that looks familiar if you've ever opened up a TV. Um, that is the pre-built uh, RF front end that goes into a cable TV or a, a, an antenna TV t antenna tuner. Uh, it's just a little module that uh, that somebody manufactures, and uh, when the guy designed this card, he just plopped that on there. Pretty much, that's it. Uh, so what this guy does, he's designed to receive TV signals. Uh, that by no means is the only thing we can do with it. Um, so since it's designed to do TV, it takes a six megahertz wide chunk of bandwidth, which is the width of a TV signal. Uh, it uh, drops that down from um, its, its broadcast frequency, say, uh, I think channel 2 is, I think, 51.7525 something megahertz, uh, which is outside of the realm of the USRP hardware. But this guy is going to drop it down uh, and center it around 5.75 megahertz, which is, again, well within the range of our hardware to acquire. Uh, it can tune anywhere in the cable TV broadcast spectrum, which is 50 megahertz to 800 megahertz. Um, which, I mean, you can get cable TV or you can let it listen over the air and you can get broadcast TV. Um, FM radio is, uh, is uh, 90 to, or 90, 88 to 108 megahertz or thereabouts, well within that spectrum. Um, TV, HDTV, tons and tons of other things. Yeah. You can pick up, if, as long as it's within the, um, that 6 megahertz wide chunk, you're not going to be able to receive something that's 10 megahertz wide with this guy. Um, a, uh, I believe an FM carrier is limited to 200 kilohertz, period. That's not necessarily mono or stereo or um, um, HD radio. Uh, you, can, you can pretty much, you can, you can sit down and process those things independently and look at them uh, using GNU Radio. Uh, so yeah, uh, with this guy you can, yeah. So, so basically all the demodulation is done using GNU Radio, all it's out of the box and into the computer, and then that's inside the computer where the demodulator actually happens. Right, well that's, that's what the, the, the real key is, is there's a lot of sort of um, intermediate demodulation going on in the front end. And this, and, uh, as I was saying, this basic RX guy isn't doing anything. This guy is actually using that header dining uh, trigonometric identity to shift this stuff down, and he's doing that that demodulation sort of, and then yeah, and then you can push that into the computer and do the actual FMAM PSK. Yes. Yes. I would really love to, unfortunately. I would absolutely love to. And if somebody wants to uh, uh, look at some stuff, I am way not a Linux expert, and I completely hosed something with a compile from source last night. I think you're in the right place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're in the right place. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would absolutely love to demonstrate it. Um, my computer, I don't have hooked up because we were having some problems with it, too. But... Uh, um, I'd love to, to go upstairs or wherever and set it up, and, and we can try to play around with it and get something going. Um, Hi, Jack. Uh, ham radio session. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess we, we can see, whatever. Uh, now, yeah, what can't you hear? Basically, cell phone, Wi-Fi. Cell phones start about 850 megahertz and go up. Um, Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz. Other cards, another talk, another time. Uh, do, do, do. And, like I said, demonstrations due to an unfortunate accident, frowny. Sorry. We'll try to get that set up. If you're, if you're really that interested, um, um, stick around, track us down, whatever. We'll try to get something going for you. If we can get it working, yeah. And then, well, you know, we've been taking questions this whole time, I guess, from you. Very active audience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, let me give you a little uh, advertisement here. Not that it, you can, you can only get it from one place, really. Um, it's uh, Edis Research, um, and, and this is this guy, Matt Edis, who uh, uh, works on GNU Radio. I, 
it seems like he works on it pretty exclusively. Um, but he he has his own company and makes these boxes, and uh, he makes the uh, these uh, uh, daughter cards and such. And uh, that's that's kind of his business. And you go to edis.com. And you buy it. And this this particular setup was about nine hundred dollars when it's all said and done. It was about seven hundred dollars for the uh, main board and the nice little kit that uh, the enclosure and such. Uh, the two cards themselves, I think, were about a hundred dollars a piece. Uh, nine hundred dollars. So yeah, that's that's where you can get that. Yeah. You can you can definitely do that. Um, so you can't. Not on they uh, I honestly like I don't know enough about that uh, that area of research to go very in depth with that. But I do know that people do that, and uh, there are actually um, there are a couple of uh, footprints on here where you can uh, you can place SMA connectors if you want, and you can synchronize clocks uh, across multiples of these guys. And so um, and they're they're some different development stuff that's doing time stamping. So um, it, there's probably the, the turnaround time on it. You, if you're doing like receive only, um, I would say definitely you could do that. If you're trying to do some kind of um, <coughs> switched mode uh, transmit receive, you might it might get a little more difficult. But um, um, yeah, it, people are definitely doing phased array type things, type applications with it, and you can do up to up to. Um, well, yeah, and if you do real sampling rather than IQ sampling, you can do four per board. Um, I do, again, I don't know a lot about it, but yes. Yeah. Um, could you briefly talk about the transmitting capability for this? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, the reason I didn't go over that, um, well, there are two reasons, actually. Um, I'm not very interested in transmitting just because that's not where I want to go with this thing. Um, the other thing is it's basically like receiving in reverse. It <laughs> works exactly the same way except backwards. It's, it's really um, the, the four digital to analog converters. They're faster and they have uh, better, better bit depth, um, uh, 14 bits versus 12. I mean, but other than that, you, you get another one of these cards that can, it's either a basic TX card that can transmit um, Let's see, the, the transmitter, the, the digital to analog converter is uh, 128 mega sample per second. So you can, and the Shannon limit applies there too, is you, so you can only transmit up to 64 mega, mega, megahertz rather. Um, so the, the basic TX card that you can get that's just the buffer between USRP and world, um, you can transmit basically some, some small number to uh, 64 megahertz, um, and once you get to the top of the band, it starts to get a little bit. You, your, the noise kind of starts to get um, signal to noise ratio starts to get a little bit um, worse. But uh, then you can use other cards that uh, actually uh, do the the, the uh, up conversion for you and can uh, take the signal that you generate on here and push that and slide that up in the spectrum, which is is kind of the reverse operation to uh, what we were talking about with this header dining. So that's, that's kind of what I know about transmitting. It's not, not, not too, too much, but, uh, uh, right, yeah. Uh, he actually, uh, Edis Research actually makes a card for that, and uh, it, it slides that band down to the USRP, and then when you transmit, it slides it up to 2.4, and it's just a card. I, actually, I think it's a, it may be um, a dual module, so that it's either that one or another one is a dual module, and it actually uh, is physically designed to fit both connectors, the transmit and the receive connector, so you just, just pop the whole thing in, and it's now a 2.4. Um, specifically, probably. Uh, spe uh, specifically for GNU Radio, I think probably he's the only one doing that. Yeah. Um, I would say it's not a bad market, but it's probably not a huge market either. Um, but you could. And you can, you can use your sound card. Um, if you uh, have a radio receiver that um, 
puts out um, audio band um, IF or something like that. Basically, the way people are doing, um, oh, what is it called? Um, like AX25 um, uh, GPRS stuff with their computers. Basically, their radio is rec receiving things. They're pushing that into their sound card and then doing the demodulation there. Well, that's not a good example. Uh, Right, and and that and GNU Radio, I, I haven't I haven't uh, studied up on it, but GNU Radio should be able to do that with no problem. How much amplification is it? Really? Yeah. Uh, enough. Oh yes, for 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 output, yes, you would, you would need an amplifier uh, to do anything illegal. Um, yeah, well, uh, if you if you wanted to go go high power with it, you would you would need something else. Uh, this this guy is not not for amplification. It's it's just to get the signals into the world, and then what you do with them there is uh, up to you. Um, again, I like to uh, stay away from admitting to things that are illegal on camera. Uh, <laughs> hypothetically, hypothetically speaking, uh, but okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and uh, just a little disclaimer. Uh, a, a little disclaimer: the, the USRP radio is is free for anyone to buy and use. Um, if you're going to be transmitting high power, please get a ham radio license and use it properly. Just don't cause people problems. I get I get a trucker going by my house like once a month who completely destroys my TV because his CB radio is putting out a thousand watts or something. Yeah, I've thought about putting up like an airsoft gun that's like radio controlled. <laughs> um, well. I think I've run over really, really badly. So, yeah, yeah, definitely.